Okay, it's time for chapter five, and in this chapter we're going to be discussing contraception and uh, ways to plan and prevent pregnancy. Okay, so choosing a method of birth control or contraception. Um, first question that we have to consider is whose responsibility is contraception or birth control? There are lots of different mar um, methods on the market. Most of them are methods that women use. Um, but even if it's intended for the woman to be in control of it, um, that doesn't necessarily make birth control a woman's responsibility. But it kind of ends up being like that. And so it, we all, I think, cognitively know that when a couple is sexually active, um, that there's a possibility of um, conception and that both partners have a responsibility for preventing pregnancy until they are ready. Um, but a lot of times we um, we don't necessarily fulfill our responsibilities. Um, I thought it'd be good to t distinguish contraception from birth control also because in our modern discussions about whether our, our employers should have to pay for our contraception and um, things like that. A lot of times people use the word contraception when they're really referring to birth control and so it's really important to distinguish the two. Contraception literally means prevent conception. So these methods are going to keep the egg and the sperm apart through one of many methods. There are a lot of different ways to keep the egg and the sperm apart. But the um, basic issue is that um, we're going to keep we're going to prevent fertilization of an egg. With birth control, on the other hand, we, we our big goal is to prevent birth. So with birth control, we're going to either prevent implantation of a fertilized egg or we're going to disrupt the implantation of a fertilized egg. So those are really, I mean, it kind of sounds the same in certain ways, but the um, difference between the two is that um, for some people, life begins at conception. And so for some people, birth control is a sin, whereas contraception's not. So um, in a conversation about who should pay for contraception, that oftentimes is a much different conversation than who should pay for birth control. Um, but since we so often use those terms interchangeably, it can get a little bit um, muddy. If you think about it like this, all contraceptions are by extension birth control because if you don't allow conception to occur then obviously you're not going to have a birth. But not all birth controls are contraception, right? Not all birth controls work by preventing conception. So con contraception is a subset of birth control. Okay, judging the effectiveness of a birth control method. This is something that we're going to talk about as we go across the chapter so it's good to just sort of set it up right now. Um, if you look at a package of condoms or birth control pills or something like that, they tend to give you the theoretical effectiveness. What that means is the maximum effectiveness when the method is used perfectly every single time. And if you actually use the birth control method that way, you'll probably come really close to the theoretical effectiveness of the of the method. But most of us have little errors, you know, little we forgot or we used it incorrectly or something like that and that's called the actual use rate of effectiveness and um, actual use is collected from actual users and what they look at is how many women who are using this method for a year become pregnant. Um, so both of these methods, both of these um, ways of judging effectiveness are going to be reported as failure rates. So the number of pregnancies per 100 women in a year of use. So as we go through all the different methods, you'll hear me reporting both of these. And the, the thing to remember is that the bigger the difference between the theoretical and the actual use rates, that really gives you the impression that this must be a pretty hard method to use. Either it's easy to forget, or it's tricky to implement, or it's messy and they really don't like it that much, or something like that. So the bigger the difference, the harder it must be to use in some way. Now, let's start with the 100% effective methods that always prevent pregnancy and also prevent sexually transmitted infections. 
this will be easy to memorize because there's only one, and that's selective abstinence. I'm not talking about celibacy where you don't have any kind of sexual activity at all, but not having any kind of sexual activity that would put sperm in any kind of opportunistic position to find their way into the vagina and then up into the reproductive tract. So um, there are a lot of behaviors that are could be included in selective abstinence that would prevent pregnancy. Some don't have the additional benefit of preventing sexually transmitted infections like oral sex you can still get a sexually transmitted infection we'll talk about that later when we get to sexual behaviors um, and STIs but the only way to not get pregnant is not to have sex and not to have any sexual activity that could deliver sperm near the vaginal opening so let's assume that you don't want to do that maybe you want to use some kind of method that's not really um, you know something that you have to buy or something that you have to get prescribed we call these the unreliable methods. Um, chance is my first example and in the actual use data, which is all we have, there's no theoretical, um, if you have unprotected sex and you just let fate take its course, um, out of a hundred women using that method in a year, 85% will become pregnant within that year. Um, the other 15%, by the way, are diagnosed with infertility and so um, chance is not a great way of preventing pregnancy. Um, now I've got this hyperlinked, this video hyperlinked in um, the module, but uh, douching. Some people think that if you douche after you have sex, um, either with a regular douche or some say, for some reason, Coca-Cola got implemented. Um, or I, I don't know exactly how that came to pass, that people thought putting Coca-Cola in the vagina after having sex would kill sperm, that it was like a spermicide because it's so acidic or something. Anyway douching doesn't work. It actually, I mean, it, I guess it's better than ha um, than chance, right? You have like half the rate of getting pregnant if you douche afterwards, but I mean 40% failure rate, 40% of women getting pregnant in a year of using douching alone kind of implies douching is not a very effective method. Um, how about the withdrawal method? Again, I have a video linked in our um, module if you want to watch it on the withdrawal method. Um, it has an actual use failure rate of you know, 15 to 28 percent of women who use this method will become pregnant within a year if that's the only method that they use. Um, there are a lot of reasons why it doesn't work that well. We talked about the Cowper's glands in our earlier chapter. Um, and then also there's the added problem of trying to um, withdraw at the height of pleasure. It's, you know, you can imagine how often you're like, maybe just one more second, and then it was too late. And so it's not a, it's not an effective method. How about fertility awareness? I put it under under unreliable because there are so many user errors in the fertility awareness methods. Um, there are a number of different ways that you can go about fertility awareness. One is what's called the standard days method and this one requires um, the couple to abstain from sex from the seventh day of the menstrual cycle through the seventeenth day of the menstrual cycle. And you know if you're not going to have sex while you're menstruating, which a lot of people don't, that means you're going to be abstaining probably from day one to day 17 of the menstrual cycle. Um, so this one has a high failure rate because it's hard to abstain for half the month. And a lot of people when they when they do um, you know sort of break the rules it's on the side of having sex right around ovulation because they've been withhold you know they've been um, you know not having sex for so long that they end up actually um, having sex right around the time of ovulation. Um, so that's not a very effective method. I th thought I had a failure rate for us. Let's see. Uh, um, one of the things I wanted to point out is that sperm can live in the vagina for up to five days. And so if the woman ovulates on day 14 of her cycle, and the last time that the couple has sex is on, let's say they're kind of pushing the envelope, and so it's day nine of the cycle, Theoretically, some of the sperm might still be alive and could fertilize that ovulate that egg that she ovulates on day 14. Um, this is a tricky method to implement. Another method is the two-day method, and in this method, the woman is supposed to check her vaginal secretions every day, and what she's looking for is really slippery secretions. Right around ovulation, um, the body generates these really slippery, almost like the consistency of egg whites, um, you know, raw egg whites, uh, secretions that actually provide like a ladder 
for the sperm to climb up and get access into the cervix. Um, so it actually enhances fertility when these secretions are present. So she's supposed to check her secretions every day. And if she noticed secretions today, then she's probably fertile and she shouldn't be having sex. Um, if she doesn't notice them today, but she noticed them yesterday, then also she should consider herself probably fertile and should avoid sex or use another method of birth control. Um, if she didn't re uh, notice secretions either today or yesterday, then she's probably not fertile today. Um, so the idea here is sort of getting in sync with your own body and it's and it's um, signs that you might be fertile that you might be um, having ovulated recently or getting ready to ovulate. Like I said though on the previous slide, sperm can live in the body for up to five days and so um, maybe she hasn't seen secretions today or yesterday and but she had sex three days ago. Um, tomorrow she could get pregnant from the last time she had sex which was three days ago. So it absolutely um, is imperative for a woman to really figure out what her body signs are of um, ovulation and avoid sex leading up to those days not just the days that she doesn't see secretions. How about the basal body temperature method? With this method the woman is supposed to take her basal body temperature. What that means is there's a special thermometer that you can insert into the vagina and you're supposed to track your basal body temperature over the course of the month and what you see on the screen is a plot of a woman's um, temperatures across the month and what you'll notice is on day 10 she has a spike of temperature and then on day 14 she has a drop of temperature. That spike warns us that she's getting ready to ovulate and then that drop means she is ovulating and so what you would want to do is avoid sex from the spike until the next time that the body temperature goes back up. So you see how after she's ovulated her body temperature goes significantly above what even the spike had been prior to ovulation. So once you're back to you know 98.2 or something then you're clear to have sex again. So again we have this window of time that's five days, six days long when the couple's going to need to either abstain or use another met method of birth control. If you pile that on top of the five days that you avoided while menstruating, which a lot of couples do, you could be looking at you know 10 days out of the month when you are ineligible to be having sex um, or you're using something else. A lot of people who use the fertility awareness methods do it because they don't plan on using anything else. So they're, they usually use abstinence and abstinence is um, the, the birth control method that probably has the highest failure rate. Um, so that's our little window where we would avoid sex or use another method. Okay. Now, to make this a teeny tiny bit easier, some couples will use ovulator, ovulation predictor kits. And uh, these can give, you know, really clear cut information about when she is ovulating. And if she does this over the course of a couple of months um, and then combines it with the um, calendar method where she keeps track of when she is ovulating, you know, if you start to realize, okay, I ovulate and then 14 days later I menstruate, and then you start figuring out how long your menstrual cycle is, and you start to figure out when ovulation is likely to occur, you can ultimately get rid of the ovulation kits because those are pretty expensive, and then uh, start to realize your own body's um, fluctuations and things like that. Of course, as we discussed previously, um, you know, this can be really tricky because this assumes that a woman's um, menstrual cycle is going to be very consistent from one month to, to the next and it may not be. So uh, these methods can be really dependent on a lot of consistency, a lot of normalcy and um, failure seems to be associated with you know situations where she doesn't have a predictable menstrual cycle. So the effectiveness of the fertility awareness methods, well um, theoretically, they should work pretty decently. You know, one to nine percent of women should probably get pre pregnant using these methods, especially if you combine them. Um, you should really boost the effectiveness. But in reality, about a quarter of women will become pregnant using this method. Um, the advantages of these methods are uh, there are several. One is that most of them are very inexpensive. Most of them maybe you have to buy a, a um, basal thermometer or a calendar or you know get download an app like uh, period tracker to keep track of your menstrual cycles um, pretty inexpensive stuff the the ovulation test kits are probably the most expensive thing you might do um, you can stop using this method anytime when you decide you do want to become pregnant just stop doing the method right very minimal risk I mean I, the, the biggest risk is pregnancy that's it 
and then you know this is one method these methods are approved by religions and so people who are avoiding birth control for those you know for religious reasons usually can use these methods disadvantages you know high failure rate it's really inconvenient it's hard to have spontaneous sex when you know you're you have to go check the calendar or you have to check your secretions things like that so um, you know it's difficult to implement it is free and you know can you, it at least boosts your uh, probability of preventing pregnancy above chance it's above the withdrawal method it's not as frustrating as the withdrawal method in a lot of ways so um, a lot of people do use this method at least at some point in their lives okay let's go ahead and take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk about the very long list of hormonal methods that are available <music>